This is Surfer of Life, I'm your host Tommy. Next to me is sitting Joona Puhakka, who is a former Olympic class diver and an entrepreneur. You have won two gold medals, two silver and three bronze medals in European Championships, bronze in World Championships in Barcelona, been in Olympics three times, Sydney 2000, Athens 2004 and Beijing 2008. You have won four times NCAA Championships in US and were named for the SDA the Sun Devil Athletics Hall of Fame 2015. You have been an entrepreneur for many years and at the moment CEO in S&P Digital, where you promise to provide cool online services and mobile applications. And you're a pretty good golfer. But hey, let's go back to the Hall of Fame 2015. There's something else involved also. Can you tell me about it? Yeah, as we were discussing about this merits, which are in history, but after a good career comes different kind of, uh, um, how would I call them, additional recognition and the Hall of Fame being one of them. But one, one cool thing that uh, I thought to mention is Pac-12 Athlete of the Century, which Pac-12 is um, Western, Co- uh, Western Coast Conference in the USA, where the top 12 schools compete against each other. And so I felt proud uh, to be selected as the best diver out of the one year history of that conference. Congratulations for that. And we'll yeah. get back to very important that. little detail here. <laughs> it is very important little detail. And it was good that you mentioned about it then. But I, I will discuss about it a little bit later. Uh, I have one question for you at the beginning. I saw this article couple of days ago in a newspaper and I saw this one guy standing out in up in a platform diving from five meters he had his suit on any ideas who this guy was that must be a handsome dude <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was a fun story and 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 there was a so so there was an article about me which was uh, in in Finnish magazine talking about how how the transition from athletics to professional, uh, you know, kind of in a, I call it a normal life. I don't consider anything normal in an athletics career, but an, a normal life with having a degree from university going into the professional fields. So how that transition has worked for me and what am I currently doing? So for that article, we were thinking about what kind of a picture would would actually describe this transition well and I suggested that let's let me put on a suit and dive off the platform so that actually gives from an image standpoint it gives a good understanding of what's the past what's the current so it was fun how did you feel diving wearing a suit on it was actually quite incredible I haven't dove off the platform for probably over 10 years and and when I was doing it I was quite nervous on on can I still do it I don't know and uh, once I once my uh, feet came off the platform, it was I, I don't know how I felt that feeling before, but it was amazing how I felt that I know exactly how this is done. I know exactly what's going to happen next and how am I supposed to do so. Overall, the dive was just like at my best times. So it's really deep inside you. You've been so many yeah. years doing. Yeah. Well, I think it's kind of like, kind of like riding a bicycle. Once you learn it, you know how it's done. So same thing. The only thing is that I'm physically not at the same same shape, but technically I still have the technique in me. Let's start by jumping straight to the diving career. What was the point when you realized that you're going to take this serious? This is your thing, diving. Well, my story is that uh, I started diving on third grade when I was nine years old. And, and on second grade, when I was eight, I was actually claiming to all my friends and teachers and family how am I going to be a how I'm going to be an Olympic athlete in diving. So I had this deep passion towards diving without ever practicing it, but it came from the sensation that I got when I just dove off the platform and how much I enjoyed it. I think it's anyone who loves the sport that they've done their whole life kind of knows what I'm talking about. But uh, so I I uh, I was explaining everyone how I'm going to make it to 2000 Olympic Games, I'm going to win 2004 games and 2008 games. From your point of view, the passion was a big 
issue that brought you for the Olympics? Yeah, I, it was always very clear to me that I, I had this passion towards sport of diving. And the passion didn't come from the idea of winning Olympic Games, although I had very clear goals on how I make the 2000 Games win in 2004 and 2008. But the passion, what I had was how good can I come? How much? How many more flips can I do? Can I do it better? How many twists and flips can I make? So the passion, the way I see it is that I had the passion to practice and become good, where competitions was just a place to match it against the field, just to see am I progressing, have we been able to make the changes and uh, what we planned on doing. So, and, and that's what I always say to athletes is that it's not, the glory comes when you do it good, but you need to love the practice. That's the, that's how you become really good. But if someone is practicing just to be good, usually they never make it because they're lacking the core approach of, of becoming excellent in, in a field. What was included in practicing diving? What kind of practicing is diving? That's, is that yeah. your question? It's, uh, it's, it's a combination of gymnastics and the actual sport of diving. So usually there's roughly an hour or half an hour warm up session, which includes just getting your muscles ready and, and flexible, but then more like gymnastics approach where we, we practice on dry land, certain feel, certain aspects. Then there's trampoline, you know, we bounce on trampoline, get better feel for that. Um, and then the actual diving itself. So we go into the pool and practice the dives and, and how to move forward and learn these difficult dives. It's really a step-by-step -step progress. So first you learn to dive head first, then you learn a flip, then you learn one and a half, then you learn two. So you just kind of build up from the ground. Water is quite rough when you land on your stomach or your back. How was it when you started? Of course, you for sure you hurt it yourself when you landed improperly. How did you manage to get back on the platform? It's it's a mentality that every every diver has to take that the pain, the physical pain, is not the issue. It's actually mental issues that are the issue. But um, you know, if th there are certain ways to make the impact easier. So a lot of the times at the beginning when we practice new dives, we wear a t-shirt. So a t-shirt actually takes off a lot of the impact or the pain that comes with the impact. Then there are in diving pools, there's these bubble machines that you have at the bottom of the pool. It, it blows air so that you get bubbles. So it softens the surface of water. So if you land there poorly, it doesn't hurt at all. You mentioned about the mental part already. Was mental coaching, mental training involved in early days already in diving? No, I consider myself a head case. So that was actually where my whole career ended was because, you know, usually athletes end because their knee hurts or they break their shoulder or something like that, which is physical related, which is easy to explain to other people. But my issue in the end was the mental aspect. So if I look back from my career standpoint, at that time, the mental coaching was not part of the coaching methods as good as they are these days. But had there been such methods, I think I would have been more successful in my career. So you th think there should be mental coaching in early sta stage already when you think about competitive sports? I, I think about any sports, but it, it, it's really highlighted in, in sports that where you deal with being scared, right? being snowboarding, diving, gymnastics, whatever there is where you're scared to do the activity. Um, but it should be involved in any kind of sport. So in the end, if you look at uh, the greatest athletes of our lifetime, let's say Roger Federer in tennis, why has he been so dominant? I believe it's not his technical skill, it's his mental skill. He can squeeze it out of himself at the right time, at the right spot, where someone else can be better from a technical standpoint, but at that specific moment, they're not better than him. So it, it, I don't think it's, it has to do with fear. There's, lots, there's very many aspects to mental coaching. Let's travel a little bit back to your career. You started as a young young kid diving, and then you moved to university at some point. How did it affect you? It's a po it was a positive change. So I had a plan that uh, for me to become as good of an athlete as I want, I need to be in the university system in the USA, and that was because the. Uh, level of coaching in Finland is good, but the um, sport is small. It's it, it's in any country. Diving is a small sport because a lot of people cannot do it. Um, so it's it's lacking the support system itself. And 
um, or there's there is a support system, but it's not efficient as efficient as in the university system where uh, it's amateur sports, but there you get professional services around it. So I, I had a very clear plan that I need to go to high school so that I can get into university. And while in the university, the point at the university was that I can become a great athlete so that I can find find uh, right kind of coach for that time and right kind of environment for that time. While in university, I realized that there's actually a good point to study a profession, something else than sports. But the whole driving factor was athletics itself. How was it in the States? Were there mental coaches when you were practicing? Yes, yes, there's quite many. And when I, when I started facing my issues, I got a lot of help. And I actually found lots of, um, lots of help from USA. I searched for help from Finland. I searched around the world. In all honesty, none of them could help me. And that's why I'm saying that I was quite uh, a head case. Uh, but I was so deep down in it that no one was able to pull me out of it. Uh, but help was there definitely and and had i learned to use that help earlier i think i could have avoided a lot of the issues that i faced you still you won a lot of medals you've been in olympic olympics twice oh sorry three times so you must have developed some sort of methods for your mindset before the jump what were your tools for that yeah Can so remember? it's it's the pressure and pride that's how i overcome overcame my fear um, so what we ended up doing is is that once I hit the deep bottom of my uh, mental state, I couldn't practice diving itself. I couldn't do the difficult dives in, in practice. And we realized this with my coach and we discussed with different coaches who athletes in diving. This is some surprisingly common issue. And uh, we found one one girl or lady who she had the same issue and she won Olympic gold while she was not capable of practicing and so we discussed how, what they did and the end result was that let's just not give a fuck about it you know let's accept that this is serious issue i'm injured it's just not a physical injury it's a mental injury and what we do is we keep up the physical shape and the feel for the board and kind of do whatever we can but they then go into competition and and just hack it out let's see what happens and, you know, during that state, I ended up winning European championships, and uh, which is amazing to me when I watch the video where I know that I'm basically blacked out and I don't know what I'm doing. Yet when I get out of the water, I can see from my face the confusion that I don't know, did I land on my belly or on my back? Yet the diving was good. So this is, this, it, it's interesting. You think in ground level, the reason you were able to do is it that you were practicing so many years that yeah. your skills were just so good that even though you couldn't even realize anything, you just automatically did it. Well, you know, I think it's been part of the success at the same time. So what athletes do is they overthink. I could, I didn't have that capability. I couldn't over. I, I overthought so far that at competition I couldn't think. I All I had left is that... For example, in 2008 Olympic Games, I specifically remember my second dive and I'm standing on the board and I, my, uh, uh, I start uh, getting dizzy and, and I'm starting to pass out. And I remember that, holy crap, that, you know, most embar- embarrassing thing that can happen to me is to pass out on the board. So what I have left is just jump and see what happens. And, and so while I was being dizzy, I did jump off the board. I am plaqued out and then I get out of the water and look at my coach. Was it good? Was it bad? And I see my coach being extremely happy and the, the 12,000 people giving me good applause. So it's it's really this very confusing world that I was in during competitions. How did it feel afterwards? Ah, it felt good, but it never... I always thought, I've had these kind of issues in the past as well and, and to get over them is that you just practice and, and, and kind of build up your mental state uh, piece by piece but um, yeah, towards the end of my career I couldn't do it anymore so how I felt was that after coach and I decided that you know let's accept the fact that this is this is a, a, a handicap that I have towards the others um, I could live with it I mean, my teammates and friends were laughing hard. They could not understand how the hell is this possible. But for me, it was very real, and my coach understood, fully understood it. So, you know, how how did I feel after the dance? I, I felt good. <laughs> oh, geez, I'm scared. I'm passed out, but I can perform. So it's kind of nice. You were jumping from one meter and three meter 
springboards. Mm. What made you do that decision? It was it early stage or? Yeah. I've always been scared of diving. So in a sense, I've been in a wrong sport, but I had this passion that overdrove my fear. But uh, I, I did platform diving early on and, and I, I did it until I was 1920. But I, um, I was doing it till I was 15 with the thought that I'm actually going to be good at platform diving. Where once I, once I reached my age 15, I realized that it's just not my cup of tea. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be good at it. Uh, my physical uh, ability is not built for it. It's built for the springboards and my strength is in springboards. So why to spend time on that one? And that's where I kind of put it in the background. And when I reached 20 and I did my last competition at, at university and then we decided that, you know, let's not, let's not waste my time in there. In 2000, you won your first European Championships medal and it was in mm. Helsinki mm. in Finland. How did it make you feel as a diver? Can that was a, yes, I can I can remember very clearly. It was a complete surprise. I uh, I barely made the team, and I remember that uh, the federation really had to consider: will they take me? Will they not? Um, but since the the uh, championships were in Helsinki, so it's easier to make the team because they like to have a big team. Um, I always knew in, in, inside me that I can be fifth or sixth. You know, but the federation at that point didn't, of course, understand it. But uh, it was a complete, complete surprise, and it's one of the most fun medals that I've ever had because it's completely unexpected, um, and that that really got my career going. That's where I realized that I'm, I'm not a lunatic with the thoughts that I can be good at this sport. It actually gave me gave me a kind of a stamp that I can do this if I just continue doing what I'm doing. The result was a sort of a surprise, like you said. Was it then easier to jump? Was it easier on the springboard before the jump than later on, as you described? Yeah, it definitely increased my confidence. So uh, this comes back to Roger Federer example. So what happened to me after that competition is I realized that, I, you know, I'm not, I don't need to look up to these divers who I've been watching on TV and studying from them, that I can actually beat them. And so that changed my thought process of going to these uh, world-class events and thinking that, you know, these guys are amazing, which I still today think they're amazing. But I realized that I'm part of it. I'm part of the top level. And, and you know, I, as long as I do my own thing, I sometimes I meddle, sometimes I don't. Um, from pressure standpoint, uh, you know, uh, after winning um, European Championships medal, after that I had junior European Championships because at that time I was 18. So of course I assumed I'm going to win junior European Championships, which didn't happen. So that's where I realized that kind of over cockiness compared to being just confident and trusting yourself. Your career, you've been, you won more medals, uh, as you said about the pressure point. Since you won more medals, did it affect you as a diver when you went on the platform? Because later on you told me that there were big issues with your head. Do you think that there was more pressure because you already won medals? No, it was not, not pressure itself. There's definitely competitions where I can explain to you about pressure and how it affected me. But if we, if we look at the success itself, it gave me a health, e healthy ego. So not pressure as you describe pressure or usually how people understand pressure. It was just healthy ego and, you know, realizing that in practice, if, if these world-class divers are better than me in practice, I don't care. I, I care for competition and I trust my certain strengths that I had and, and compete with my strengths. So it just kind of made them stronger. Year 2000, there also were more happenings and you went for your first Olympics in Sydney. Can you remember what were your feelings when you were, you were uh, I'm trembling here, you were flying to Sydney, to Australia. It's a long flight from mm. Finland, so there's a lot of thoughts mm. to be made. Can you remember your feelings? It was the Absolutely. first Olympic Games. Absolutely, and it, it was a dream come true to make it to Olympic Games. I understand how very few athletes ever make it to Olympic Games. Um, uh, I was 18 and I realized I don't have a shot at winning. In my heart, of course, I tried to win, but I, like, with a rational thought, I didn't expect it out of myself. 
Um, but I, I remember traveling out there and, I, and my thoughts were that, uh, you know, I'm probably going to be so damn nervous that I'm going to fall off the board. You know, how am I going to deal with the nervousness that I have? So I ended up uh, uh, psyching myself to a point that I felt nothing when I competed. So I overthought at that time. So uh, I was thinking that I'm going to be nervous, which means that my hands are shaking and there's too much adre- adrenaline in my blood so I cannot perform um, so I, I wanted, I, I kind of did mental practice on, on, and prepared for being calm. When the day came, when I competed, I was just way too calm. I was out of the competition because I had nothing in me. So there's a, a, a certain level of anxiety that is needed to perform. I had none. So I went from one direction to other. But, uh, Sydney, uh, I think I was 30, you know, 32nd, 30th, somewhere there. So middle of the pack. But what it did for me, because I was a young guy with with huge uh, dreams, it, it made me realize that I'm not far off. And I don't think my coach agreed with it at that time. But in, internally, I felt that it just proved me right, that I, I have what it takes to be on the top. And, and at that time, I thought that, you know, 2004, I'm, I'm actually on my childhood dream plan. I made it to Olympic Games in 2000, and I'm going to win 2004. Then 2004 Athens. And yeah. You started talking about it already, but tell me what happened there. Well, that's the time when uh, I didn't have a shot at winning, but I had a shot at a medal. And I sure as hell would be happy if I'd had a medal. Um, but uh, going into that competition, I, I had a legit chance at medal. In, uh, again, might be my, in my own head, but I still today think so. Um, I went there. I did quite well in in I I did, I did okay in preliminaries. Uh, then I went to semifinals and and again I I did I overtried. So I, at that time I was thinking that my skill is that I jump high. My uh, default or or what I was lacking compared to the better ones is that how clean of an entry I could make, meaning how much splash or no no splash at all comes when I hit the water. Um, so I thought that, you know, I compete with my strengths. I'll just jump a bit higher, make it more impressive from that standpoint. So I did jump a bit higher. I did have the adrenaline in me and I ended up screwing up because of that. So 12 people make it to the final. Uh, I was 14th. So uh, in all honesty, uh, that was the breaking point where my mental issues followed from that because the disappointment was so huge for me that how can I be such an idiot that I don't I didn't trust my basic skills I tried to be better than I am where if I would have been just what I am I would have very easily made it to the final and very much had a chance to the medal so that was where my mental state started going into in the wrong direction so mentally I was very strong from 2000 to 2004 Christmas and then it collapsed what happened to your career after that well, 2000, so after Olympic Games and, and the disappointment, I, I was so motivated to practice so damn hard that I'm going to I'm going to revolu- revolutionize the sport of diving and I'm going to make bringing new dives that no one has ever seen and being capable of performing them. And uh, my strength was the physical strength that I could actually do dives that no one else could do at that time. And that was the thought process that I'm going to practice so hard that and make the new dives so that no one can flat out they cannot beat me that I'm just gonna win if I just do my basic stuff and so I started I, I went back to school uh, in the fall and and I started practicing so hard and my coach actually told me that this is the wrong thing to do we should actually take a year off and be a student and, and party and enjoy your life you've never had the time to be just a student and and uh, looking back he was right and he tried to force me into it but he couldn't force me into it and of course as a coach it's probably quite difficult to say no when someone is so extremely motivated so i ended up practicing really hard and, and came christmas 2004 or, or december 2004 and uh, you know i had, i reached the point where i started thinking two little things and i lost the concept of the what I want, what I was actually doing. So there was one specific dive, one specific moment where my mental state collapsed in, in regards to diving itself. What happened then? Well, I, I refuse to explain in detail just because if, if some current athlete listens to this and it's kind of like a seed 
the thought, what I had in my mind is a seed in your brain that starts growing. So I, I can, uh, off the record, I can explain yeah, it, but I not understand. on the record. Let's not, let's not go into that. Yeah. I but the, 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 the overall concept was that I started looking into a too little technical, too specific, specific technical thing. And once I was on the diving board, I couldn't perform the whole dive. And so then it started a ripple effect that affected every single dive I had. And in the end, What happened is that I managed through 2005. I came, but it was a difficult year. I came back. I actually almost medaled at World Championships in 2005. I was fourth. Uh, I could have been second. Uh, it was very close. So I performed well, uh, but this was already when I was a lost case in a sense. And then uh, I took a longer break, came back in 2005 fall, Christmas time, and then did a few months and then eventually we reached a point in 2006 that my coach told me that you know you know it's time to quit you know you you've reached the point that you're uh, he's scared and he, he feels that I'm I'm danger to myself so that was the level of, of mental state that I reached and I'm, I know if, if other professional athletes listen to this they know what I'm talking about um, so I quit uh, in a sense quit in 2006 for um, spring and uh, not officially just you know maybe take a year off two years maybe I never go to Olympic Games and maybe I never come back to the boards my coach said that I'm welcome back but only if I'm ready and so I, I took the time off and let Federation know that I'm, I'm not going to be part of the national team but then they uh, came back to me asking could I just come and hack it out in, in European championships and then once they they kind of They sold it nicely that we don't care if you practice, we don't care the shape you are in, just please come in. You've been performing so well that, you know, we, we wish you'd come. And I said yes, and I showed up and ended up winning uh, again with no practice. And so that was kind of a spark that maybe there's a different approach we can take. And that's when we discussed with coach that, you know, let's accept the fact. And let's just compete. You think that way it made the difference that you were not now overthinking because on the diving went. on the diving board I was overthinking but I still. already yeah 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 absolutely still passed out in a sense <laughs> but uh, uh, in 2006 it was kind of fun it was fun you know that everyone in my team in the national team in the diving community knew that that guy hasn't done a damn thing since March and, and so it was pretty damn amazing I, winning having on the same competition a world champion who I was able to beat and so it's kind of like you know pardon my words but what the fuck is happening how complex do we make this and how much wrong are we in our own thinking when it comes to professional athletics what was, was the expression from the other athletes After just, you won the just your laugh champion. and and probably confusion on like what what are they doing wrong why is this possible why can this guy show up and actually do better than ever um, so it's interesting and 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 in some some ways I uh, someday I'd like to sit down with a, a sports psychologist and actually really deep dive into these thoughts and and look into that could we learn something from my mental collapse. Does it actually prove that the way we teach people in, in sports, that there's something that can be done better or differently? I am positive that you would be able to help people on that. For, first, you just too. figure out yourself. <laughs> <laughs> After that, your career still continued. Yes. All the way to 2008 Olympics. Yeah. It continued because I, I actually had a good discussion with my dad. Um, And, and of course, I was considering that. Do I push through this? Does this make any sense that the pain that I was in during practice and daily life was very heavy? And uh, my dad said it well. He's like, well, you know, look at it from a different perspective. Once you're old, how do you feel? Which one makes you feel better? That you pushed through, you made it to the Olympic Games. Maybe you didn't win it, but yeah, you, you did it. Compared to that, you quit now, and as a, as a grandfather, when you're telling stories to your kid, which one do you want to tell? I quit, or I actually hack it out. So it was a very easy choice then, that let's continue hacking out, let's just kind of go with the flow and make it to 
make it to 2008. And, and, but it was kind of nice knowing that August 21st, I think, was the competition. That that's the end of it. There's a deadline to it. That's, that's where it stops. A lot of athletes struggle after their career. They can't really find a new passion and it's very difficult for them to find a job. Mm. But you went to university and you had this already on your mind that you're going to ha- have a good career yeah. in the work scene. Excluding my mental state, I would have still, the plan was to quit in our uh, 2008 Olympic Games. So that didn't change because of the mental state. Um, the the plan always was that I, I need to get a university degree where I was studying marketing and international business. And um, the 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 whole thought process, I've seen so many excellent athletes be celebrated and be good at what they're doing. But after the sports, they got nothing. And I didn't want to fall into that trap because I think that sports can end any second, any day. So I wanted to prepare myself to the life after sports in a sense. And so the transition, no, it has not been easy, but I've had a plan. I've had a goal and I've had an education to pr- to go towards my goal. So my situation has been a whole lot easier than a lot of athletes go through who, who make it to Olympic Games. Is there this passion now? What you had already when you were diving? Now, when you're thinking about your career as an entrepreneur. These are very similar. And and I have similar kind of goals in my entrepreneurial life. So I'm not looking... I, I'm a, I'm a, I have a small company. Uh, so we're nowhere near my dreams and, and goals. Uh, but uh, the the same thought process follows. And and so after after sports, I went into work a few different companies, which were excellent places to work at. And, and I enjoyed both of them. But I always had this underlying thought that entrepreneurship is actually close to my uh, experience, what I have, which means that, you know, when I was working in a lar- large corporation, there was, uh, it was kind of, um, kind of uh, steady, you know, good things happen, bad things happen. And, uh, um, but emotional standpoint, it was same. But um, in, in entrepreneurship, I wake up, I might feel good, I might feel bad. You know, if let's say I start the day good, then the world can collapse around me and I feel like crap during the daytime, and then I might go to sleep with actually doing something fantastic. So, yeah, entrepreneurship is definitely something that I like. You travel to India a lot. Mm. What makes you do that? My team is in India, and, I, and, and because I've been traveling my whole life, I've been practicing to get rid of um, racism thoughts in my head. And uh, by racism, I mean that every single person has some pre-existing assumptions of another person they don't know. And so I've, uh, because I've met people from different cultures, I've been a foreigner myself, living abroad for a long time. So I've worked uh, uh, my, myself to think that, you know, I need to look deeper into than just the, my own initial thoughts. Usually, I'm pr- I'm pretty much proven wrong every single time. So uh, I I worked at a company called Accenture, which is the uh, world's largest uh, consulting firm, and there's lots of majority of employees actually are located in India, and and that's where I kind of got to got to learn that in that company that the true skill is located in India. That. <laughs> Us here with the client are kind of showmen who just make it more easy to understand. But really, the skills were in India. So when I started my company, I I, I wanted to find passionate people from India who are very proud of what they're doing, and they they're the top people in the world of of this field. And so that's how this company was formed. And and um, I keep traveling there. Uh, because it's it's difficult to manage from distance, so I need to be a f- real human being for my team, and 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 the whole actual innovation is very simple. What I've done, which is that um, I know personally the people who work for me. Instead, when usually companies who have a remote team, they don't know the team at a personal level. Where I've been to their families, I you know I have a cup of tea with the parents when I come there, and so it's it's a whole another world or or whole another world that I'm doing this at compared to what is commonly known. In India they do yoga and all these kind of things. Have you been soul searching 
in India at all? I would love to go, but I haven't. And in all honesty, there's a small group of people in India who do it. So this is part of this pre-assumptions that in India there's yoga. No, there's a small group of people in India who do yoga and then there's the rest of the people. So you gave a good example of what I'm fighting against. It was good and, that you cleared that up yeah, for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But they have a yoga minister. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so yoga is, India is known for these things, but if we talk about briefly about India, so there's 1.2 billion be- people, so you can imagine that there's anything there. So, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of Western people go into uh, India for these yoga treats or, or meditation treats, but that's such a small piece of the country. Well, it's good to know. Yeah, <laughs> it's good that it you is. light me up. Yeah. A couple of more questions, and then we're gonna wrap this up. You get a, you have some work to do, yeah. so we'll head there. What do you think if we could make a phone call now for the younger Jona Puhakka in 2004? What would you tell him? Trust yourself. That was the whole learning that I got from the medal at 2000, the surprise medal. Is that you're doing right things. Just keep doing it and trust yourself. 2004, I, uh, you know, why, why does anyone try to perform at a high, higher level than they are? It means that they don't trust that their skills are good enough for the goal that they have set. Now, it's, it's, it's measured against the internal goal, what you set to yourself. I could have reached it had I just been doing what I'd be practicing and not try to be something that I'm not. Strong words. <laughs> it's good to finish it. Hey, thank you so much for sharing this information yeah. and opening up yourself for yeah. me here in a talk. It's been a nice conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thank and you so much for coming, Yona. Yeah, you're welcome.